There are three things you can do to help us out. One, you can make sure you subscribe to this channel. Two, is you can leave a comment here or on Apple Podcasts. And three, if you really want to help, you can follow this link to see how you could be a supporter on Patreon. Okay, I'm going to start with a personal reminiscence, actually. I think in 1979, in late 1979, I was I was doing a lot of work for Sounds magazine, and Alan, Alan Lewis, who was the who was the editor, wrote a headline in Sounds over a piece that, 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 that it actually had one of the longest headlines I've ever seen in my life, and it was a new wave of British heavy metal. And the joke was, it was such a long headline you couldn't get it in the headline space. And I thought, well, if it, that really won't last at all. Well, how wrong I was in every <laughs> single respect, because this now, the new wave of British heavy metal is, is celebrating. It's gone past its 40th anniversary, hasn't it? And, you know, we're, we're beyond that. And now it's, uh, it's getting given a due, its due in a new book called Denim and Leather, The Rise and Fall of the New Wave of British Heavy Metal by Michael Han. Michael joins us now. Welcome. Hello, Michael. Hello, David. Hello, Mark. What a pleasure to be here. Nice to see you. Were you actually in the in the in the heart of all this? Were you? No, I, I'm I'm a fraction too young. I'm I'm 52. <laughs> all right. so, oh, I thought so. I thought so. <laughs> so when the Wobbum exploded, I was 10. But this was the first prepubescent music that I got into. A couple of boys at my school. Uh, Tom and Daniel Kennish and also a guy called Ian Watts were buying this stuff. And there was no pop music in my house, not because I was Amish or anything, just because my parents didn't like it. My dad liked jazz and my sister didn't care at all. So I didn't have that older sibling introducing music to me. So I was really left with whatever I was friends, whatever the people I was friends with at school kind of dumped onto me. And at 10, 11, 12, that was heavy metal. That was, I just, this was the natural state of things, heavy metal. I mean, wh why, why would anyone need anything more? <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't take much notice of what was on top of the pops and so forth. You were, you were interested in this stuff. Well, in those days, it was on top of the pop. Hey, well, I suppose it was, yeah, eventually. This is, the, this is the thing that kind of seems incredible now, looking back on it, that through 1980 and 1981, Top of the Pops had heavy metal bands on, not every week, but you had a fighting chance. I mean, if you've watched the repeats, I mean, owing to the vagaries of what the BBC will and will not show, um, owing to who was presenting the episodes, in 1980, it did appear that either Gillen or Saxon were on top of the pops every single week <laughs> yes. without fail. <laughs> Gillen, Saxon and Bad Manners. So they are the sound of 1980 yes. and 1981. <laughs> yeah. As presumably also on Saturday morning kids television as well. That must have been the other outlet. Well, yeah, I, I, you know, I didn't talk about so, so much about that in the book, but uh, last night I did an event for the book uh, with John Deverell, who was the second singer in Tigers of Pantang. And um, he was saying that Tigers of Pantang were the closing thing on the final ever episode of Tis Was, which, which I had no idea about. So, yeah, Saturday morning TV. But I think Swap Shop was maybe a bit too respectable for Norm. I have no memories of metal on Swap Shop whatsoever. Just uh, endlessly of members of Duran Duran pushing their sleeve jacket, their, their suit jackets yes. on the seats. <laughs> Did you mention Saxon a moment ago? I seem to remember that Biff out of Saxon was always part of that kind of rotating cast of characters from popular music who appeared on kind of panel shows or you know if they needed somebody from heavy metal it was <laughs> was it is that it a very very stretchy <laughs> time <laughs> time. yes i don't I, I do not recall ever seeing heavy metal on a you know, pop quiz or any other any of the other things that were around right, at the okay. time i mean the people who are in there talk about the the, the, the holy trinity of broadcasting I mean tommy vance um, Top of the Pops and Old Grey Whistle Test, as right. it still was at that point. Um, but it's also worth remembering John Peel as well. I mean, people have John Peel pegged as, oh yeah, he, he just played the most esoteric, the coolest, the hippest stuff. Loads of these new over British heavy metal bands got their first plays from Peel. Girls Played School did, of, uh, Vardis did, Def Leppard did, loads yeah, of them. Yeah, Def Leppard, I remember that. And uh, at Girl School, very peel. But no, Def Leppard, absolutely. And uh, why was that? Did he think there was a kind of punk sensibility about it all? 
Well, certainly some of the musicians think that Peel thought they were punk bands. Steve Zodiac from Vardis certainly thinks that Peel <laughs> thought they were a punk band, despite the fact they sound very much like status quo at times. Right. Um, but they were released, the first wave of groups released stuff independently. So they had yeah, some yeah. of that spirit. And yeah. Yeah, Peel would support underdogs, you know, yeah. even if he didn't much like the music, just as he sometimes wouldn't play big acts, even if he did like the music, yeah. because yeah. they didn't need it. So when a band like Def Leppard, yeah, were driving across to Hull and then getting 150 copies of a single printed up themselves and pressing one on the hands of John Peel, I don't know, I suppose he thought it was almost his moral duty to play it for these kind of yeah, young, yeah, young yeah. upstarts from, from, the, from the back of nowhere. And I mean, this is, I think, one of the, the things that's part of the legacy of the new wave of British heavy metal is that, you know, metal is now very much a DIY scene, has been for a long time. Of course, there are the superstar groups on the majors, but DIY is hugely important. That all comes from the new wave of British heavy metal, which in turn pinched it a bit from punk. Yeah. But, you know, it, it showed that you could try and be Kiss on a budget of 10 bob rehearsing in a church hall. You know, <laughs> yeah. That's what lots of these people wanted to do. Which is kind of part of the charm, isn't it, really? Is that they, it was low budget, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when I was writing, one of, one of the chapters kind of came... It came to fruition really because I noticed that so many people were saying exactly the same thing about you know their, their time on the club circuit, working men's clubs, um, pubs in the East End of London. And they were basically all trying to be the glam bands that they'd seen on top of the pops. People always talk about Sabbath and Zeppelin and Deep Purple in the context of New Album, but glam, British glam was hugely right. important, you know, because New Album is largely about three minute songs and getting out there as fast as you can. Yeah. It's Mark so Bolan, isn't it? And stuff yeah. Like yeah. Mark Bolan, a big hero to loads of these people, yeah. and Bowie and The Sweet, especially. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but so they, they, these bands would try and do huge glam shows. In working men's clubs, you know, there's so many stories of people building their own pyro, filling up. Yeah, who is the pots. band who had little pots of metal pots full of gunpowder? They someone all... else who spent their entire budget <laughs> on one block of dry ice. <laughs> who was that? It was it was Angel Witch who spent everything on a block of dry ice to play yeah. the Ruskin Arms, which they put <laughs> under the stage, not realizing there was an extractor fan under the stage, so all the dry ice went out onto the car park of the Ruskin <laughs> Arms, and nothing came out onto the stage. Yeah, Venom from. Newcastle were especially keen on their homemade pyro and they used to do all their they almost never played live they didn't play in London till 1985 and they played just a handful of gigs in the first five years of their existence but they rehearsed all the time in a, first a church hall and then an art centre in Newcastle and they would do their full show they would bring in a nine foot drum riser into a church hall <laughs> and set off fireworks all around the place oh, yeah. Manchester their guitars had a story about attaching a Catherine wheel to the headstock of his guitar while they're rehearsing in a, in a church hall and, and then being surprised that flames were shooting around the place and that these people were mad. But Venom, when they did their first ever gig in the US, they flew over on commercial airlines with a bomb board in their luggage, didn't get arrested. Um, the opening night in Staten Island, they set off all their pyros, but uh, an overzealous roadie had double filled their paint their, to their tin paint pots with, with gunpowder with the result that one that wasn't secured shot out of the stage and flew into the back wall of the balcony where if the gig had been sold out someone might have been killed and another was propelled downwards through the stage where it smashed into a water pipe causing an extra geezer to come up <laughs> through the stage and that was only the first night Oh, you wouldn't get that nowadays, would you? you really? I wouldn't. Help I and loved safety. all the details <laughs> about, about the kind of working men's clubs. I think it was Def Leppard who were going off and playing working men's clubs because they could get 350 quid. And they would, they would, they would tell them that they could, they could play Thai Yellow Ribbon, whatever it was. And then they'd do that and take that money to, to support playing rock clubs. Is That's that right. right? It was all That's kind of very, right. they were trying yeah. to just get the money to do it. Yeah, the working men's clubs where you turned up and entertained people, they would pay money. And then for Def Leppard, they'd go off and play at, you know, Crooks, Crooks Working Men's Club, which was where they first got seen by Jeff Barton for sound. So, um, yeah, let's talk about, let's talk about where this starts, because this starts with Jeff Barton, doesn't it? Well, really, it starts with Alan Lewis, yeah, okay, um, who was on. the editor of Sound. So Jeff Barton, in May 1979, went to review the Neil Kay Heavy Metal Crusade gig at the Music Machine in Camden, now Coco. Uh, which was Angel Witch, Iron Maiden, and Samson. And with these three bands packaged together, Alan Lewis, who was the editor, uh, rolled a single, the, the lengthy headline that you mentioned um, in, in, to, to sum it all up. And that headline was, if you want blood, open brackets, and flash bombs and dry ice and confetti, close brackets, you got it. 
the new wave of British heavy metal. So that's when it Have gets you got that name. issue of sounds there with that's you? Fantastic. I, I don't, I'm afraid. Oh, what a shame. Oh, no, 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 carry on, carry on. Go on. So I was, uh, that was all from time in the British Library. All right, okay. So that, that's the point at which it gets christened. But the amazing thing about that review, if you read it back now, is that Jeff Barton really didn't like very much of what he saw. <laughs> but Alan liked the phenomenon. <laughs> he liked that's the, the idea. And Alan <laughs> was a really, I mean, a great guy, Alan, but very commercial guy. He was always looking for an edge. I was mm. always looking for a, a place to position sounds as it had territory of its own, you know, and and that was a hugely Didn't successful you make case. The point that, that he put, I think he had Justin Haywood on the cover or something and thought, this is all wrong, and just switched to punk rock just overnight. Well, I mean, that, 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 yeah. that, that was, I think, a story about Barbara Sharon having a oh, Rod right. Stewart yeah. interview, and Alan <laughs> yeah. News is going, no, Rod Stewart is over. Rod yeah. Stewart is over. We're putting punk on the yeah. cover. At a time when, you know, that, so that was 76, when Rod was still a major yeah. star. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, the, the sense of daring that you would get in the music press in those days of, yeah, fuck it. Let's give this a go. Let's Absolutely. pump this up and see if we'll buy it, see if people will buy it. Which yeah, is yeah. one of the things that, you know, with the loss of the weekly music press. Oh, definitely. Um, I think I think we miss, because, you know, I mean, I know from being a, a commissioning editor on a national newspaper that, honestly, you're not going to confect a movement for yourself, because you might look silly. But if you're doing a weekly music paper, you can try these things out this, and have a go and see yeah. what sticks. Who were we talking to, Mark? The other day, I was talking... I'm, my memory is like a sieve. But somebody was a, a former PR uh, and just talking about how they, they most... Oh, it was... Um, Jane Savage? Yeah, Jane Savage. Yeah. Talking about, about uh, you know, the way you got anything going was you made them part of a scene. And so then you, you presented the scene. Yeah, once and you had three bands, they'd say, right, the whole new scene, and it's called, you know, whatever it was. Lion. Whatever it was. Because, and yeah. I thought it was really interesting. I'd never really looked at it in that way. But it's so true, and it's particularly true in the in the era of the weekly music mm. press, where they constantly need to be saying, this is up or this is down, you know. But it, it took off from there, didn't it? And then Jeff kind of had to had to go with it, really. He had to... Here's your torch, Jeff. Carry it. Is that how it works? Well, Jeff was was the kingmaker for all this. Everyone yeah. agrees about that. You know, the, the the imprimatur of Jeff Barton was make or break for a band, and every band wanted him writing about them, writing about them. Um, I mean, it was interesting though that you know in those days, your know, music music journalists. Well, you'd have a, a memory of this in a way that I don't. I'm afraid because I'm still so young and sprightly. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but but, the, but you know, people were telling me in those days you literally could send your demos in to Jeff Barton or to oh, yeah. Paul Suit, all the people at Sounds, and music journalists would listen to them. And I guess that's a way, a measure of the way the industry has changed. That these days, you know, if someone's just sending you their music blind, it's kind of Guys, who's gatekept kept this? You know, yeah, there is so much music out yeah. there. I'm not going to get to your. Well, in those days, there wasn't that much. Good. Mm. It, 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 the, the number of people who had the energy to do a demo and then make a tape mm. and then send it off was mm. relatively small. Yeah. And there was also a real commercial value in being the first one to latch onto that and be yeah. paper that, that that discovered this particular band. You know, and yeah. Throw yeah. About it. it was very yeah. very valuable actually. It's real kudos. Yeah. But it, I mean, it was such clever journalism by Alan Lewis to spot the potential of this oh, yeah. and also to understand that it wasn't just about those three bands on that one bill, that there were these bands all around the country. Every single town in Britain had its metal band, its youngish metal band. And once you could kind of roll them into one, it wasn't just, it wasn't like a scene like, you know, New York in 76 or London in 77 or New York in 2002, because it was everywhere. It was I mean, there were centres like yeah. Newcastle and Birmingham and the East End, but it was everywhere. You know, my town had its heavy metal band. I, I grew up in Slough. And uh, for one term when I was 12, our teacher was a man called Mr. Michael Cook, who had long hair, wore a sledgehammer lapel badge, and Slough being a band, sadly, a town sadly bereft of notable rock bands, he featured in the Slough Express every week. So <laughs> me and Tom Kennish used to go up to him and say, sir, sir, are you Mike Cook from Sledgehammer, sir? He said, well, why, why, why do you think that? Well, sir, you're wearing a sledgehammer lapel badge, and you look like Mike Cook out of Sledgehammer, and you're called Michael Cook. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking we've about. We've seen that. Sledgehammer, no idea what you're talking and about. that's clearly that's, <laughs> that's fantastic. It, it, it's, it's so true how it was um, in every region. One of my favourite memories of this time, which I think is mentioned in your book, is uh, when I think Ross Halford took wonderful pictures of Rob Halford 
in the garden. Now, go tell us about this. Go on, because it was a wonderful thing. <laughs> this is too fair. This, this photo is on Ross Halpin's website. You can find it easily. But I've never right. seen it before until I was browsing through copies of sounds. This is from 1978. And never to Jeff Barton has gone to Walsall to interview Rob there Halford. And, and the photos yeah. are Rob Halford in full stage gear. Leathers. Leathers, cap, holding a whip standing in the doorway of his tiny little semi. It's a council house, yes, isn't it? Yeah, what? Right. It's you just wonder what the neighbours were thinking. And, and this is another of the things from this era. I mean, photography, I, I wouldn't say it's an art form necessarily, but for a lot of these bands, the photographs were every bit as important as yeah, the records. Oh, definitely. So Venom talked about, you know, preparing for their photo shoots every bit as much as they would for a uh, for, for a recording session. And the incredible photos of Venom, you know, mouths open, bearing axe, wearing leather loincloths, standing by Tower Bridge. Or Vardis, clutching a bloody great axe. You know, like they're ancient warriors. And there they've stopped the road from me on Hampstead Heath. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is incredible. I wish I, when I go out for my walks on Hampstead Heath every day, I wish I would see a 20 something heavy metal band in loincloths holding axes. It would liven things up no end. <laughs> Because they, you, the book's called Denim Leather, you know, and the and the appearance is hugely important, isn't it? Even though people may deny it, you know, oh. but there's a there's a kind of odd relationship with appearance, isn't it? I like the uh, I think it's Richie Blackmore talking. Was it was it, uh, was it Graham Bonnet was uh, was singer. Great, Graham he, Bonham became the singer of Rainbow, yes, and Richie Blackmore did not like the way he looked. Um, he <laughs> liked his voice, but he didn't like the fact that he had short hair, wore aviator shades, wore a you know, like croupier kind of jacket, red <laughs> shirts, tight trousers. So Richie Blackmore told Graham Bonnet that he needed to grow his hair before they went on tour. Um, and yeah, Rainbow being probably the most dysfunctional band in the history of rock, it appeared that no one actually saw each other, more or less. <laughs> the the gods yeah. okay. <laughs> but Blackmore had apparently given orders to a roadie to make sure that Graham Bonnet didn't get out of his room <laughs> and get his hair cut before the show. But Graham Bonnet did. Now, this may have been Newcastle, it may have been Glasgow. And <laughs> recollections differ. But Bonnet came on stage that night with short hair and Blackmore was so furious that he he literally wanted to hit him he wanted to smash him around the head with his guitar for being so disobedient and for being so on rock so on rock so not to be on rock yeah and they ended up having to have a band meeting about it the following day about the state of Graham's hair and Graham Bonnet's recollection is yeah honestly I told them you hired me for my voice, not for my hair. But I just, oh no, no, I no, don't no. like long hair. I'm not having long but that's hair. Right. That's that's fundamentally wrong, though. You see, it? but I think Graham nice Bonnet ought to get an award like. for having a genuinely independent spirit, for being the man in a heavy metal group prepared to to have short hair. That shows real nerve. That does. Doesn't well, it? I've got to it say does. though, I think it really, in, if you look at it in terms of the brand. Richie Blackmore was right, because I remember as a kid okay. thinking, Graham Bonnet's hair is wrong. <laughs> right. So, you know. I, I totally agree with you. So yeah. let's talk about you as a kid, and let's talk about the fans, because obviously this is a hugely important part of the story. You know, who were the people who latched on to this, this phenomenon? I mean, or is it impossible to say? Were they all kinds of people? I think you'd have to say it was blokey. Yes, um, <laughs> which we'll return to actually. Well, well, about Loki is the Come. original wave of heavy metal, I think, but because there were some girl, there were, there, were, there, were, there were a couple of there were girls' school and rock goddess, rocks, were, were, were rock two, goddess. Two, yeah. Two, but two girls' school were complaining uh, in the in the reminiscences that they never got girls to come and see them, did they? they no. all, which no. is amazing, really. Yeah, but, but what's interesting about heavy music now? I mean, I, I'm not deeply deeply mired in this world but I go to see heavy bands because I review a lot of live music and I'm always surprised now by how how much more even the gender split yeah, is yeah, at yeah. heavy gigs and it's more than a say a typical indie gig I would say no, there are more women at heavy gigs than indie gigs but in these days no I mean this was the music of backstreet pubs of stale beer yeah, yeah, of, yeah. of rundown cigarettes it was young working class guys and this was a really working class movement in a way that you know, nothing that's come come since has been there, there isn't a single band in here that says we met at college not one of them no we met after no, college absolutely. when we'd all moved to they all met yeah. at school or yeah. they all met you know playing in their crappy club covers bands around clubs all of them and they were all doing it from their teens it was literally you know the only thing that they had that appealed to them 
A lot of them were working in factories at the same time as trying to be in bands. Venom, you know, were employed in factories until well after, you know, everyone who knew about heavy metal knew who, who they were. Um, but of course, they weren't making any money. So um, after they gave up their jobs and tried to sign on, uh, the person at the Dole office said, hang on. We've researched you. We've got this video of you live at Hammersmith Odeon. We've got these reports on you in tour in America. You're rich. You're rock stars. No, we're not. We made, <laughs> and, um, at, the, at the most, we made £30 a week from neat records. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's a strange world that's completely lost. Um, I mean, in, of course, the book is about heavy metal, but it, it's not about, you know, critically analysing the comparative worth of the second album by Samson and the first album by Witchfind, because honestly, I don't care. Um, it's as much as that, it's a, it's a book of social history. It's, it's yeah. about a lost world in the music industry. Because Norton would never happen now. You know, these bands would not exist in their separate cities waiting to be found. They'd all be down in London. They'd all have publicists. They'd all have lawyers. They'd all have agents. <laughs> Instead, these people were doing it for themselves right up until the Point that suddenly EMI was saying, "Here's tour support. Here's a studio. Go and make yeah. an album. Get out on the road." You know, it was completely homemade, which is which is the absolute charm of it. And the fans embrace that as well. I mean, Norbum had its own CBGB, which was a pub in Northwest London, um, where Neil Kay set up the Sound House, the, the heavy metal Sound House at the Bandwagon, where he'd get bands to play. They'd come down. They'd, they'd do sets. Bands will get picked up from there. But this is where the real homemakeness of Nwobam became famous, but through a man called Rob Loonhouse, who I'm afraid I could not track down. I believe he doesn't talk about those days. But Rob Loonhouse was the man who made a hardboard guitar and took it down to the sound house to play. Every time that, you know, he, he, every time he went out dancing, he took his, his hardboard guitar with him. Hardboard, not cardboard. People are very, quiet, yeah. are very yeah. specific about that. And the sound house used to have, you know, heavy metal band air guitar competitions. They did. They whole did. bands of oh, people. They did. Yeah, yeah. Air drummer, two air guitarists, air, air bassist, drummer. air singer. Right, yes. And they would have competition. They would get international rock stars down to judge him, they which did. is incredible they did. now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> God, did I go to one of these things? I think I did. Uh, God, we did I something know, at the enemy. I remember my air synth playing. I kind of imagined it. <laughs> <laughs> it would be hilariously funny as a reaction. So, what was the kind of what was the high point of the of the whole movement? What were the kind of you know, peak moments? Well, Nineteen eighty is the Annus Mirabilis for for not just for Norbum, but was that metal, the Monsters of Rock? The first Monsters of Rock. First Monsters of Rock. But that I mean, that's a huge year for metal as a whole because, of course, it's the year when Back in Black came out and became you know, the biggest selling rock record ever. Yeah. Um, but Nwobum, that's when all the, the, the good bands really start getting their first significant workout. So you have Wheels of Steel by Saxon, which I suspect that none of this stuff is up you fellas' street. But Wheels of Steel is a good album. It's the first Iron Maiden album, the first Tigers of Pantang album, uh, the first Def Leppard album. There's British Steel by Judas Priest, which, although Priest predate Nwobum, British Steel is absolutely a Norman record. I mean, it's so completely in the heart of it. It's inspired by the Norman bands and it inspires them in turn. And uh, after that, you know, that's when it achieves its commercial peak and it builds on that. And then it, it, I think some people will disagree. I think it dies with the release of Pyromania by Def Leppard at the start of 1983. Why did you think that was the end of it? That's very interesting because you say that's the, that's the precise moment where it all seemed to, to, to fold up. Partly I say that's the precise moment because I had to end the book somehow. Absolutely. Uh, You've got to do that. <laughs> yeah. I'm all in favour of that. We figured that. Go on. But partly because Pyromania is the album that changed Metal's approach. You know, so many of the Northern bands looked at what Def Leppard had done, yeah. or, or more specifically, their labels or their managements looked at what Def Leppard Definitely. had done and said, guys, that's what you got to do. You've got to yeah, crack yeah. America. But there was one big difference, which was that Def Leppard were given £700,000, eight months, and Mutt Langer to produce. Yeah. And the other groups weren't. So you know, I think Diamond Head were given £30,000, two weeks in the studio, and a guy who'd engineered for Mutt Langer to produce. And incredibly, you don't get the same results if you spend £670,000 <laughs> less, spend, se um, spend seven months less, and don't have the man who actually makes the record sound amazing. I mean, by 1987, Saxon were doing Christopher Cross covers. What kind of world were we right. living in that <laughs> Saxon no, covered damn. Christopher Cross? But, yeah. be but before uh, Dev Leppard made the huge album, they were already kind of doing really well in America, weren't they? Thanks to MTV. Is that right? 
I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. My headphones cut out for a oh, second. Okay. Uh, before Def Leppard had their big breakthrough with the huge album, they, they were already doing quite well thanks to MTV in the States, weren't they? Because MTV was very important for these groups, wasn't it? Well, about- for Def Leppard it was. Um, yeah, Def Leppard had the song Bringing on the Heartbreak from their second record, uh, which was a yeah, power ballad, clearly aimed not at uh, Scotty 14-year-olds um, in Scunthorpe or Slough, but aimed at American radio. And when MTV launched, it was the perfect song for Leppard to get on there. They, they, filmed, a, they filmed a video, a non-expensive video by the stance of the time. But the thing was, almost no one else was making videos at that this point. This is it. In, in, in the rock world, you know, yeah. you can be... Next pop, but this meant that Def Leppard could be the rock band that got on MTV. I mean, if you think back to Iron Maiden, yeah, even when Number of the Beast was smashing into the charts, the lead single off that was Run to the Hills. The video for that was largely kind of old silent movie still footage yeah, yeah. of comedy, cowboys, yeah. and Indians. Yeah. yeah, that's how little attention big metal yeah. bands were playing to video. But Def Leppard wanted to be like Duran Duran. They didn't want to yeah. be like Judas Priest. They wanted to be like Duran Duran. So of course they were going to make videos and the videos got glossier and glossier. And by the time you reach Pyromania and its lead single photograph, they're making a video, making a video that is indistinguishable from the ones that come from the big pop acts. Right, it's no right. longer just, here's a rock band on stage with long yeah. hair. <laughs> Who are the bands that you think that, that you know, had they had bigger, bigger budgets or whatever that, that should have made it? Because you just mentioned so many. I just thought all those names are so familiar now. Praying Mantis and people like that and Witchfinder General. I mean, was there anybody you felt was just uh, deserved a bigger, bigger shout? Uh, everyone who loves this era would say Diamond Head. Um, Diamond Head self Who was the reason album. Metallica started? That's was right. Metallica heard them and thought, if they can do it, we can do it. This is fairly basic. Well, Diamond Head self-released their first album um, in 1980 called Lightning to the Nations. And you can hear that they've been listening to Led Zeppelin studying intently, but you can also hear that they paid attention to the more aggressive stuff that was coming later. So it's, it's a bridge between old hard rock and the future of heavy metal, that record. Yeah. But also... It's just such a tragedy. I mean, they, Diamond Head, Brian Tatler and Sean Harris are such, such lovely men. Uh, they both still live in Stourbridge in the West Midlands, uh, where, where the band was formed. Yeah. They don't have anything to do with each other nowadays, as happens with bands. Things fall apart. But Diamond Head, they barely played any gigs. You know, they spent three years just Sean and Brian writing in their bedrooms. I sh- Brian showed me his archive of stuff. You know, these long set lists from days when they, they were not actually playing any gigs. They had album cover designs they did for the day when they'd have an album out. It's like, absolutely charming. Um, but 1980, they suddenly exploded in terms of reputation. They, they got to support ACDC. Well, it was a big break. Peter Mensch was interested in managing them, which could have changed everything. Unfortunately, uh, Diamond... Ask, well, Diamond Parton, who, should, who he should sign. <laughs> well, the, the Diamond Head stayed with their current management, which was the singer's mum, Linda, who was the secretary at a cardboard box factory in the West Midlands, <laughs> and her boss, Reg, um, who owned the cardboard box factory. And they looked after Diamond Head. With the result, unsurprisingly, that they didn't really have a lot of industry muscle. I mean, they generally thought that they could record that album and then just shop it around the majors and someone would buy them. Whereas, of course, the majors said, no, no, yeah. you'll come in, Yeah, yeah. we'll yeah. decide who produces it, we'll decide what songs go on it. So when they finally got an official album out, which was not till 1982, it was all too late. The moment had passed for them. Right. So um, how did, were these people happy to talk about this, all this? You know, were they delighted somebody's writing a book about this period? I'm sorry, David, my, my, my headphone jack is crappy. It's all right, don't worry, I'll say you, you it just said, Were they all pleased to be to be contacted and asked about it? Did everybody want to talk about it? Yeah, most of them do. Um, I mean, for, for a lot of bands, obviously, what happened 40 years ago is the biggest thing that ever happened in their musical career. Um, so, yeah, they like to revisit it. And also... It's not actually been written about that no, much. Absolutely. I mean, certainly no, not outside not the specialist press. There are books about about this era, but they are they're published by small publishers. Yeah, they're yeah. often kind of clippings jobs. So yeah, I think people fancied the chance, you know, before it was too late to have what they'd done immortalized in a big book. Uh, the only band really that I couldn't get hold of was 
Iron Maiden, or rather, people who remain in Iron Maiden. To but they day. don't really want to be associated with it. Do they you? don't. Well, not to Def Leppard, but Def Leppard were happy to participate. Um, I mean, Maiden's management was said, we have no problem with you talking to anyone who was in Iron Maiden at the time, but Steve Harris and Bruce Dickinson are not going to talk to you um, because we are we are not a Northern band. It's kind of. <laughs> yeah, I get why you're saying that, because no band that transcends a scene ever wants to end up being tied to it forever. But come on, if you go back and look at sounds from 1979 and 80, you do have the members of Iron Maiden and the members of Def Leppard. Yeah, we're absolutely a northern band. The new wave of British heavy metal is what we are. We're part of this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, come on, fellas. You can't really have it both ways. No, I mean, you if, you're that, if you're yeah. that big, nobody will care about whether you're yeah. once associated with the scene. Would Paul McCartney contribute to a book about Mersey Beat? He probably would, you know, because he's Paul McCartney. He can do what he likes. Mm. Um, mm. But I like the way at the end you, you do this is kind of where are they now section. And you, you, yeah. you, you trace all these bits. And as far as I can see, pretty much all of them are still going. All of them, yeah, kind of, are. all of them, still playing in some form or other, aren't they? I mean, which they, is, they all which are. is an idea of just how much affection there must have been about the whole thing at the time that there are people still wanting to go. Yeah. And see. But also, when you look at the gigs that they're doing, you know that they are not doing it because you know, hey, this is my pension at all. You know, they're playing in you know, kind of northern revival nights at pubs in Gravesend. They're doing it because they want to get out there. And if they walk out at the end of the evening with 50 quid, well, that would be great. But you yeah. know, you are not doing those nights because it's going to make you rich. Yeah. But almost all of them. And I mean, some of them, because you know, metal never forgets, as, I, as I'm prone to saying, um, some of them, when they go around the world, they find themselves surprised by how many people want to know about them. So Rob Weir from Tigers of Pantang, now, Tugs of Pantang think of themselves as the fourth of the big four of New Album because they were one of the first bands to get signed to a major, but it never really happened for them commercially. Um, so Tugs of Pantang, they had a gig. It would end up being cancelled in London, which was a free show at a pub up in Archway. So, you know, OK, that's not a lot of people. On the other hand, Rob Weir, their guitarist, was telling me about, you know, before lockdown, going over to play in Brazil. They'd been invited over. And he got into the club and thought, hmm, this looks a bit big. Half an hour before stage time, looking out and thinking, we're in a 2,000 cap room. There are about 50 people here. This is going to be awful. Half an hour later, house lights go down. Intro tape comes on. He walks out and goes, oh, my God, there are 2,000 people here. This place is full. How did this happen? And when you get people telling you how it still makes them feel so alive to go out yeah. and play those songs and to know that, know that records they made a long time ago are connected to the history of a music that cherishes history because it really does yeah, i think yeah. it feels great for them and you know it's not just gigs a lot of them are still making records tigers are still making records diamond head are still making records raven are still making records i mean raven had an album out a couple of years ago that had some of the best reviews of their career from the metal press didn't get reviewed in uh, in mojo or uncut unsurprisingly but no, you know yeah. there you go yeah um yeah. and and the other beautiful thing for me is that there isn't a lot of bitterness. I mean, some people are angry. They, oh, I shouldn't have been forced out of that group. Or yeah. mm, we shouldn't have done that. But there isn't kind of bitterness about how this ruined my life because it never happened for me. And Brian and Sean from Diamond Head are two of the most unbitter people you could hope to meet. Although that is almost certainly because um, aside from Leopard and Maiden, they probably ended up being the most successful Northern group because Metallica covered four Diamond Head songs. Yeah, never, and yeah. they never had to, they've never had to do yeah, that again. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the link between Metallica and Diamond Head is so intense. In summer 1981, Lars Ulrich, who was still a teenager, flew over in the midst of the summer riots of 1981 uh, to catch Diamond Head at the Woolwich Odeon. Yeah, you know, he literally got into Heathrow, went over to Woolwich, saw Diamond Head, where he said he was a bit surprised by how homespun it was. He'd imagined it was going to be a huge arena rock show rather than four lads with their homemade, um, homemade banners. And afterwards, he sought them out. And he ended up staying in Stourbridge with Sean and Brian in their family homes for the next month. Um, he, he ate Sean Harris's, Sean, Sean Harris out of house and home, always eating. Uh, and also people would wake up to find Lars Ulrich in the middle of the night, sitting at the end of their bed with a record player, playing all the New Orleans singles that he'd been able to get hold of that day. <laughs> I mean, is this kind of like parallel universe of just kind of joyous intercontinental friendship? Yeah. But I suppose also it's interesting, isn't it, that, uh, you know, and I, spe I think this may be a consequence of streaming, that music seems to live longer nowadays. You yeah. know, that it, it, may, it may come back 20 years later. It may yeah. take 20 years for the signals to reach Brazil or yeah. wherever it is, you know.
And so, you know, people have longer careers. Do you think the, the kind of relative absence of bitterness might be something to do with the fact that you mentioned earlier that they were, they were generally from working class backgrounds? They were, they, I mean, they were kids as well. That's the other thing. You know, they went into this with, with dreams, not expectations. They didn't go into it with marketing plans or strategies for five album campaigns or anything. They went in there because it just looked like the single greatest fun they could have. And most of them had great fun. I mean, there's this rash of, of books at the moment and rash of talk about, you know, what the music industry does to people. Yeah. Uh, how people get into drugs, they get terrible mental health issues. And now I'm not saying none of that happened in the one, but no one was talking about that. I mean, I asked no. most people about, you know, how, how prevalent were drugs? And there was, nah. Yeah, I mean, you know, you'd see some sometimes, but it, it was beer. We were all about yes. beer. <laughs> and, um, um, but also and there's as, a real fraternity, wasn't there, in the metal uh, sort of world? I always got the impression because, it, you know, only only a certain amount of the press ever wrote about it, and the rest were incredibly disparaging. Well, and, you it know, could be. It's, it's it not like be... being a member of Pulp or Blur or something where you're getting just written about everywhere. And, and you know, there was a real community where where they kind of felt threatened by the outside world or attacked by the outside world. Which... Well, it, it could be really catty on the inside. I mean, some I remember reading those articles where you know some some will be slagging off so and so for not being real metal. But yes. that was all. It was, it was like it was like a family thing. You know, with your dirty laundry was kept inside yes. metal. Yeah, 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 yeah. You'd <laughs> slag each other off inside metal, but the minute you know yes. any sounds or the outside world came calling, said, "Fuck you!" No, this we're is metal, all together. And we stick <laughs> yeah. up for each other. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, look, there's the book, Denim and Leather. Uh, the Rise and Fall of the New Wave of British Heavy Metal by Michael Hand is is out now, presumably, Michael. It is published, well, we're recording on the Wednesday. It's published on the Thursday, February the 24th. Right, so this week you can you can get a copy of this and uh, and relive those days if you went through them or, uh, you know, learn about them for the first time if you didn't. It's uh, very, very entertaining. Absolutely. Really funny. Fantastic Thank you. stories. I, well, I do promise anyone who just thinks this, this is a book about heavy metal that it is funny. I guarantee oh, you it, it is, is funny. It All is, the way through. Really it's extremely funny. It's full of cartoonish. Sometimes intentionally funny. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.